and welcome to Windows in Time, the tumultuous Jackson County Rebellion, one historian's personal perspective, presented by Jackson County Library Services and the Southern Oregon Historical Society. I am Leah Pastizo, Digital Services Specialist. This program is being recorded. Please mute your microphone and turn off your camera to ensure a quality recording. There will be a time to answer your questions at the end of the program. Jackson County Library Services acknowledges that its libraries are located within the traditional lands of the Shasta, Tekelma, and Gatgawa people, whose descendants are now identified as members of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians and Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, as well as of the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians and Modoc Nation, who were forced to relocate to Oklahoma. We take this moment to recognize the indigenous peoples whose traditional lands are where residents of Jackson County live today. JCLS is committed to fostering understanding, deep respect, and honor for indigenous people, and we encourage you to learn more about the land you reside on. For more information, go to jcls.org land. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. And now I'll hand it off to Larry. Jeff Laland, our speaker today, is an adjunct professor of history at Southern Oregon University, and he has 30 years of experience as an archaeologist in the U.S. Forest Service. Jeff has published two books and many articles on Oregon history and on the Pacific Northwest. He was our featured speaker at the very first Windows in Time over a dozen years ago to a sellout crowd and has been well received at many other fine Windows in Time presentations since that time. We are happy to have him here with us today speaking on the topic, the tumultuous Jackson County Rebellion and historian's perspective. Uh, with that, I turn it over to Jeff. Some of you have been here for a while will remember the uh, uh, periodic appearance in the Mail Tribune, uh, I think almost every year of what was called Our Valley uh, as a, a supplement, and each year it'd be on some different, different theme, and uh, periodically it'd be on the theme of local history, and there was a almost always a one page article on this event, uh, the Jackson County Rebellion, and the story of the good government Congress uh, attempted takeover of county government <clears throat> in the early days of the depression, 1932, 1933. So without further ado, gonna launch into this, um, this is one historian's perspective. And people can take other uh, approaches to it. That's the beauty of history. Um, but I see this event coming out of a long tradition of dissent, dissension, uh, and uh, distrust of authorities, and actually basic honoriness, as I use up there on, on that slide on the, on the screen, that is been endemic to Southern Oregon since its first settlement by whites. So I'm gonna start out and kind of give a little background on that tradition before launching into the actual story of the, the episode, the events of, of the early depression here. So we are a very distinctive region of the state We've long been known by people up in the Portland Willamette Valley area as a place that's distinctively different, and different politically, socially, and our history has been different. And that dates uh, to the very first settlement down here in the 1850s, farmers and miners, uh, real rough and tumble settlement, uh, Indian Wars, uh, influx of young men from all over the country and overseas during the gold mining period, completely different uh, events and episodes and trends than anywhere else in the state up to that time. So from the very beginning, Southern Oregon started acquiring this, this uh, reputation up north, very different place. <clears throat> and the people that settled here in the beginning 
in some ways were different than from up north in the Willamette Valley. Uh, overwhelmingly, they were from the uh, lower Midwest, lower parts of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, the upper South, Virginia, uh, Kentucky. And they were uh, Democrats back when the Democratic Party was a conservative party. It was by and large the party that totally su supported slavery, uh, not just in the uh, in the South, but most Democrats in the North said that's just fine. It was a um, coalition of different interests, and you have to, you know, uh, kind of be sensitive to interests you might not be all that in favor of but that it keeps the coalition together and slavery was the glue. And so a lot of these people came out here, same kind of people settled in the Willamette Valley. They did not want slavery. They also did not want blacks here. And very, uh, so that's where Oregon's black exclusion laws came from that many of you are familiar with. But what, what made the difference is Unlike the Willamette Valley, unlike the, the cities and towns of, of up north, Portland, Salem, so forth, our area was almost without the kind of uh, New England, Northeastern uh, people that were Whigs, later became Republicans, that had a very different outlook, who were uh, very interested in uh, education and uh, were favorable to a strong central government. It was totally the opposite of these uh, farming, uh, rural type Democrats that settled both up north, but they were the by far the majority down here. There was even a, a very powerful Democratic politician down here named William T. Vault, who was a supporter of slavery here. And he wanted to peel off Southern Oregon and parts of Northern California into a new territory that would allow holding of slaves called the Territory of Jackson. Well, most of the people that voted for him and supported him were not supportive of that happening. They didn't want to see slavery here and they did not at all want to see African-Americans here. That's part of our history. So to vault, uh, was a very uh, unusual character, and he ended up being Speaker of the House in the Territorial Legislature up in Salem. The election of 1860, the election that was so decisive and crucial and that precipitated the Civil War, because who was elected? Abraham Lincoln, who uh, was ran on a platform of no expansion of slavery into those new Western territories that had been acquired um, uh, after the Mexican War and the treaty with Britain that gave us present day Oregon, Idaho, and Washington. No, no slavery expanding. And this, the South was uh, extremely upset by that. It would see their power, the political power. Uh, reduced over the years, which they uh, would not uh, have anything to do with. It. And so there he came the secession of the South soon after uh, Lincoln's inauguration in 1861. What's interesting here, down here, is in Oregon, Lincoln won with a plurality and not an overwhelming plurality. But uh, there were three candidates. You see Lincoln, and over on the right, that's Stephen Douglas, who was a Democrat, who was more of a Northern outlook, uh, was in favor of a, a policy known as popular sovereignty. We don't have time to go into that. And then the one in the middle down below, that was John Breckinridge, a Southerner who ran, also ran as a Democrat. So this election split the Democratic Party in half. And Breckenridge was pro-slavery, very much pro-slavery. Well, Lincoln won in Oregon, but down here in Southern Oregon, who won a fairly solid, sizable plurality, but John Breckenridge. So that shows a, a, a major difference in outlook from the people down here with those further north in Oregon. 
And during uh, the Civil War, there were uh, people were concerned about uh, possible secessionists uh, causing problems. Uh, and uh, T. Vault's newspaper was shut down by the federal authorities as a kind of a traitorous uh, propaganda piece uh, uh, proposing a separate independent Pacific Republic of present day Pacific Coast states that would have been slave holding. Um, and so there was a small post in parts established near Phoenix, Camp Baker, to keep an eye on things down here. Settled, uh, it was established for other reasons as well. And these, Ashland was always, always been different than the rest of Jackson County in Southern Oregon. It was uh, dominated by Whigs and then uh, in the late 1850s became a Republican bastion. And this is at a time when the Republican party was kind of the progressive reform minded party of the day. And uh, some Ashland residents are shown posed in, uh, here in front of a building on Ashland's Plaza in their uniforms. They were a militia that uh, you know, got together, had maneuvers up in the Cascades near Howard Prairie uh, in case of, of need, uh, should there be some sort of insurrection here in Southern Oregon. And there was a threatened one in uh, Waldo, the county seat of Josephine County at the time. Skipping a few decades ahead, the 1890s, a time of depression, the great uh, so-called panic of 1893, the worst depression America has been in until that time. Farmers had been hurting for decades before that, following the Civil War, and you had a lot of angry farmers in the Great Plains, East Texas, and other parts of the South, and uh, on the far West, and they formed a reform-minded third party known as the People's Party or also the Populist Party. And this, throughout American history, this is by far the most powerful uh, third party uh, episode in our history. And they gave the other two major parties a real run for their money. Populist, it was very, very strong here in Jackson County. And the uh, uh, populist candidate for president when uh, the first uh, time around, uh, James Weaver uh, made a very, very strong showing down here. Uh, third party candidate making almost half of the votes in, in this county at that time. You don't have anything like that since then. So you're kind of getting an idea of the trend. There are some farmers growing wheat and you can see Table Rock in the background there. Most farmers in, in uh, the Pacific Coast, California, and Oregon were wheat farmers at this time. This is before large scale irrigation. So you didn't have the orchards and the more intensive uh, agriculture that you had after the 20th century began. And uh, there was a populist press newspapers that always castigated the so-called courthouse ring or gang of allegedly corrupt officials, nepotism, graft and so forth. So there was this focus by uh, the People's Party adherents out in the rural areas against uh, the people that are running county government. Sound familiar? <laughs> okay, so, um, and of course the county seat at that time was Jacksonville. And Medford <clears throat> established by the railroad in 1883, uh, right in the center of the valley, very soon grew from this rustic looking kind of Dodge City appearance here with the false front buildings and wooden sidewalks and so forth into steadily uh, into the, the metropolis of Southern Oregon, which it remains today. After the turn of the century, there was a, a real change. Uh, large scale irrigation, discovery of how uh, uh, fertile, the fertile lands of Rogue Valley could grow some, some really good fruit crops. First they tried apples, got apple scab, didn't do that well. Then went to uh, pears, slow ripening winter pears became very valuable commodity. Uh, orchards being developed all over the valley and coming in as a 
incredible influx at the time were these affluent, well-educated uh, men from the East, large of the Chicago area, buying up orchard land, building very large homes up on the hillsides where they could survey their holdings, all their uh, fruit trees coming into bloom in the spring and watch the picking in the fall. Uh, a lot of them were Ivy Leaguers. These are college educated people whose families kind of gave them a, a real uh, stake, a grub stake to come out here and make a mark. And they did. This was something completely different than had ever been here before. The social strata, uh, very elitist, <laughs> uh, sophisticated, uh, cosmopolitan people into this rural backwater as it had been. And uh, some splitting and resentment began to grow. The uh, These people, they establish a university club, which I think the only university clubs are uh, in, in Oregon at the time was in Portland. And uh, maybe there's one in Eugene now, but it's probably this one here was the only one between Portland and maybe Sacramento or San Francisco. That shows how different things were. This is a new thing happening and there were some uh, reactions to it. And here's one of those early orchard barons. Uh, uh, and yeah, he's wearing his mud boots and he's got his sleeves rolled up, but you don't see him up there pruning uh, the trees. Uh, and this, the orchard boom was about 1905 into the teens. It became a speculative bubble that did burst in the teens. And Medford's population, which had grown incredibly between 1900 and 1910 actually declined to the 1920 uh, census. This is some of the booster material uh, for Jackson County showing all the various resources that are available and offering a thousand dollar reward for anybody who could show any other place in the United States that had so many resources in such a small area. Looking from the foothills uh, north of Jacksonville towards Roxy and Peak, Medford be in the distance there. World War I was the real boon for American farmers. So much of uh, the wheat and other grain growing areas were involved in the war. <laughs> Guys marching off to fight in the trenches or elsewhere. So American agriculture had a real boost uh, in during World War I. But then after the war, those other areas began producing again. Prices plummeted, there's lots of production. And there was a major recession in the early 1920s. And it was uh, out of that, in part, that the Ku Klux Klan uh, made its arrival in Oregon and became a very, very powerful force in Oregon politics uh, during much of that decade of the 1920s. Uh, the Klan's, uh, one of its main things was this kind of populist nativism, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Other people, there'd been all this immigration from Europe of Catholics and Jews and Greek Orthodox, and they wanted uh, that halted and pushed back. Perhaps familiar to you. Um, so the Klan uh, was actually powerful all over the country. And it didn't have to be powerful in the South because the South had, uh, after Reconstruction, established Jim Crow, apartheid, racial apartheid, and had African-Americans totally under the thumb of white supremacists. Elsewhere in the country, the Klan of the 1920s, the first Klan was during Reconstruction and only in the South. The second Klan, the one of the 1920s, was spreading throughout the country. It was in Maine, it was in Utah, it was all over Texas, West Texas, against Mexicans. And uh, it was particularly in Oregon, anti-Catholic because Catholics were seen as 
being loyal only to the Pope and they would vote other ways than the native born white Anglo-Saxon Protestants wanted them to vote. So anti-Catholicism, and it was intense. It was really, really nasty stuff. And you read some of the stuff from a Medford newspaper, a weekly, the Medford Clarion, the kinds of things that were said there. It'll kind of curl your hair. It's like stuff you see on the, on the internet sometimes. So that's also in Ashland, down Siskiyou Boulevard, downtown Ashland. That's uh, the old Oregon or Ashland Hotel where the Wells Fargo Bank is today. It was very acceptable at that time in many, many ways, but it caused a lot of division. This is in Grants Pass. Uh, marching down the main drag, and that biplane would circle around towns at night, pulling an electric light banner behind it with a cross and KKK on it. So this was uh, a time of severe division in, uh, in Southern Oregon between those that supported the Klan and those like uh, Robert Rule, the editor, owner, publisher of the Medford Mail Tribune, who did not. And he faced real difficulties during the Klan period from boycotts, people not, and people stopping their circulation and so forth. So this was a nasty time in Southern Oregon. And it gained a whole lot of notoriety because of three mock lynchings, kidnappings and mock lynchings that took place here by Klansmen. And as I said, uh, nationwide, these, these are Klan women marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. You can see the Capitol Dome in the background. And the Klan, as I said before, it loathed Jews, Catholics, foreign immigrants, and so on and so forth. Secular liberals and all of these groups had grown in numbers or power and influence uh, since about the 1880s. And uh, people who supported the Klan feared this. They were in a great deal of anxiety these are some cartoons from the Klan period from various publications, uh, not here, but various places in the country. You can see the menace of modern immigration. That's a really nasty dragon that's vomiting out these like cockroaches, which are foreign immigrants coming into the country. Uh, there's the, the, the serpent uh, entering Eden from Europe, the old world, uh, curled around a branch in the old world, and then coming over that wonderful white picket fence into the USA and using uh, tempting with the apple of liberalism when really what it is selling is Bolshevism, communism. So this is the kind of, and all three of these uh, cartoons deal with the Romanism, the papists, the Catholic church. And there's the, the, the Pope with his tentacles and everything. There's a heroic Klan man uh, on the right uh, that through the ballot will destroy the power of Rome in the United States. Photos, of the Klan was throughout Oregon. It's estimated by some that almost half the members of the Portland police force were Klan members or very strong supporters. That's a photo in Albany, another in Roseburg there. Uh, the Klan put forward a, a, a initiative to outlaw all parochial schools. It was a very big question. Amazingly enough, uh, it was it won statewide, but again, a little difference. It didn't pass here in Jackson County, probably because the sisters, the nuns, at the Catholic hospital in Medford, which was the town's only hospital at the time, uh, had helped this uh, very welcoming to all the people who were suffering from the great influenza epidemic. And so people were afraid if they voted against Catholic schools, and there were such in Medford, uh, that those sisters who ran the school and the hospital might say, well, we're going to pick up our toys and go home back up to Portland, where our headquarters are. But you're going to want to treat us like that. People were afraid of losing their one hospital. That's probably the reason for that vote. And then comes the Depression. Hard times. Uh, 
in brief, the Jackson County Rebellion that I'm talking about was a movement that was called the Good Government Congress. Uh, watch out for terms like that. Um, and it, again, brought a lot of national notoriety to Southern Oregon. But unlike with the KKK of the 20s, which was national in scope, the 1930s Good Government Congress, GGC as for short, which is what it was known as locally, was purely Southern Oregon's own. Why did it happen? Well, those years were the worst of the hard times of the Great Depression. And here, uh, there was tremendous distress, mortgages being foreclosed upon, large scale unemployment. Uh, the fruit crops were not being picked. They were just allowed to over ripen and fall on the ground. There was no market for lumber, uh, livestock, fruit. So this man, this is the, the uh, powerful uh, motivator and call it kind of the Zvengali or Rasputin of the Jackson County Rebellion, Llewellyn A. Banks. He uh, grew up in Ohio, came to the West Coast and uh, was quite a risk taker. Uh, he uh, became wealthy uh, through the fruit industry, ended up buying large uh, tracts of citrus orchards in Riverside County, California. He had a large, comfortable home in Hollywood. You read about him in the LA papers. Uh, he had a governess for his young daughter. And he uh, came up here looking into the pear orchard situation in the 1920s when things were good. And he ended up uh, actually moving here. He was believed to be, and he actually was at one time quite wealthy, but at this time he was over investing into some very shaky propositions. And by the early thirties, he was being pulled under by the depression, just like so many people in rural parts of Jackson County, especially were. And the other person in the lead of the Good Government Congress was Earl Fail. Been around forever, published his weekly newspaper, the Pacific, Pacific Record Herald, uh, in which year after year he castigated the gang, which to him was like the populace before, it was the corrupt and cons conspiratorial people that ran things. It was the elite, it was the establishment. And he uh, focused on and provoked more and more resentment from let's say working class, blue collar at the mills and people out in the back country, the hinterland, real rural areas. He ran for office almost every election and didn't do well until late in the game and starting to do really well with the beginnings of the depression. So the rural urban divide and the social class divide, these are pretty familiar today. These are a bunch of men folk enjoying a dinner that the women would have prepared for them. This is the Beaver Creek School out in the Applegate Valley probably a work party working on the school. And the uh, outlying towns like Lake Creek, Butte Falls, Prospect, Applegate, as well as a lot of people here in Medford who were of lower income became real supporters of what became the Good Government Congress under banks and fail. Look at this photo. This is the day hack men folk who lived in uh, Eagle Point and had this ranch way up the South Fork of Little Butte Creek. And the fellow on the far left, that's young Everett Dayhack, who was shot dead by revenue agents who were raiding an illegal moonshine still near Eagle Point out on Reese Creek. And uh, Fail and then Banks uh, focused on this to in inflame people out in the rural areas. Uh, and they were already anti prohibition. Well, they were anti-prohibition enforcement. <laughs> they, they were making a good amount of money from selling moonshine, making it and selling it. And the bootleggers had come to town in their cars with it 
you know, stashed in the trunk or whatever. Uh, so they were making a, a, a scratching by with uh, sales of illegal liquor that, that they had made. But uh, this event, this killing was uh, just a searing episode for many, many people out in the, what you could call out in the sticks, if you will, out in the rural back country of Jackson County. And Fell fastened on that to great uh, advantage to his uh, movement, Banks and Fell. This is the Medford Hotel. This is the so-called Colony Club. These are the people that came during the orchard, the richer people, um, uh, orchard barren types. And this looks like a New York City debutante ball. <laughs> How different are these photos from the ones uh, that I showed you before at the school and the day hacks? So you had a real lifestyle divide, educational divide, financial divide. And that photo I showed you of Medford a while before, now it's looking like this by the early 30s. Quite a coming place. There's Robert Rule, the uh, editor of the Medford Mail Tribune, a Harvard graduate from Oak Park, uh, Chicago area in Illinois. Uh, he worked on the Crimson, the newspaper at Harvard with fellow uh, schoolmate uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and came out here and uh, made a go of it. <clears throat> Had a hard time during the Klan period for the reasons I told you about. And there's a brand new uh, county courthouse was a still not quite completed in Medford. Medford got the county seat in the election in 1926. There's the Willem Banks again. And he purchased uh, a uh, newspaper, a morning to newspaper, the Medford Daily News. And he had an opinion column in there that he titled, uh, once in a while, but very soon, and it appeared once in a while. Uh, but uh, within a, a year or two, it was appearing every day on the front page. And in his piece there, Banks expressed deeply anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic sentiments. The Jews are the cause of the depression, and there's a conspiracy, and, and they're in with Wall Street and the Bank of England and the Rothschilds family and blah, 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 the usual kind of stuff. And he proposed having a dictator uh, take us out of the depression. He, he thought Senator Huey Long of Louisiana was a good bet. He thought he was a real man of the people and he could lead us to the promised land. So Llewellyn Banks, more and more vocal, more and more extreme. And he was now being sued for slander in his newspaper, as was Fail. And he was not paying his debts after investing in the newspaper and all, all this orchard property, many other enterprises. And so he was, he was facing ruin as so many businessmen were during the Great Depression. But this only heightened his appeal to these followers. You know, he's like, he's one of us, he's a wealthy guy, but they're trying to tear him down. You know, he, he's our man. And there he is with his wife and daughter at Yosemite National Park with one of his two Cadillacs. That's his home here in Medford on West Main Street. Um, large home, it doesn't look like it so much in that photo on the upper left, but uh, it had a lot of rooms, a lot of fine furniture and oriental rugs and knickknacks and so forth. And uh, they lived in a high style, he did a fair amount of entertaining which he'd done down in Hollywood before. And pretty soon lots of people were making the, the trek to Banks' home to talk with him in the evenings. And this, the descriptions of him that he was a mag magnetic personality, charismatic uh, speaker who could just draw people in, totally certain of himself. This is several photos of him with his daughter Again, uh, posed in front of one of the Cadillacs there. And the, the one on the right is definitely here in the Rogue Valley with his daughter and then her uh, best friend next. And then in the background, that's uh, his daughter Ruth's uh, English governess 
who uh, apparently liked to have a sip of brandy and was very good at billiards. So not many people here had governesses. So the local issues and outcomes of the great 1932 election in which Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected and the Republicans were basically pushed out, Herbert Hoover off on the curbside now, and you had the New Deal, but it took a little while yet. Here in Jackson County, uh, Banks and Fell formed what they called the Good Government Congress and uh, proceeded to run a slate of candidates, including Earl Fell for county judge. In other words, the commissioner of the county commission at the time, the chairman of the county commission at the time. Uh, the county judge was head of that board of commissioners and also had some judicial responsibilities. They don't do it that way anymore, but that's what it was then, county judge. And uh, with all the support out in the outlying areas and working class people in Medford and so on, uh, the uh, results of the election put absolute fear into what we can call the establishment here. Uh, the people that had always been pretty much running things. And after Banks came, he was uh, really challenging the local uh, middlemen of Packing House Row, the pair purchasers under consignment. He was, do he was doing things all different, trying to revolutionize and overturn the situation. So, whoa, what's going to happen? 1932, there's Judge Fail in office. And within uh, just a few days of him moving into his office in the county courthouse, the corridors are filled with good government Congress members uh, loitering in the corridor, uh, uh, grimacing and kind of mumbling, uh, muttering at who they saw as their enemies, which included the district attorney and, and some others. But the election of sheriff, uh, that election actually uh, elected Gordon Skimmerhorn, who was the uh, good government Congress uh, candidate. Now think of that. County sheriff can uh, deputize people, allow them to carry firearms openly, uh, enforce or not enforce the laws. And we've all heard stories about county sheriffs sometimes becoming little dictators. So there was a, a strong evidence that of, strong, of major irregularities in the sheriff's election out in the country precincts where people have voted in the Grange halls and the one from schoolhouses that there'd been some ballot stuffing. And so uh, the establishment figure, figures call for a uh, recount which banks and fail fought tenaciously. We're not going to have a recount. There are a great number of meetings at or uh, near the courthouse on the lawn uh, with banks and fail and their supporters. And uh, threatening violence, uh, holding up a hangman's noose. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? So, okay. The uh, outcome was that the ballot recount had to go forward. So what is, um, and here's the Good Government Congress uh, membership card. Uh, one of the many meetings at Banks's newspaper, this indignation meeting at the recount, we're not gonna stomach that. Uh, there were lots of threats of violence and um, major division in Jackson County society. And it became so bad that the Portland Oregonian, that newspaper sent down a special correspondent to the front, as they called it, down to the front to cover this fast breaking uh, story of, of impending violence. The recount was scheduled for a particular day in February. <clears throat> the ballots were held in the so-called vault in the rear of the courthouse on the ground floor. This is the front facade facing Oakdale, as you know. So on the other side was where the ballots were stored. 
This is one of the meetings on the courthouse uh, lawn. Same meeting that's on the cover of the book. If you look, you see all these hands raised out in the people, the onlookers, the supporters. Hands like this. This is not the Heil Hitler. I, I'm sure it wasn't, but uh, I'm sure either Banks or Fell said, how many of you out there don't want to have a recount? Raise your hand. That's what, we, that's what we're seeing there. And so this, the good Congress leaders and speakers are the dark figures up there on the top of the stairway into the uh, courthouse and onlookers filling out into the street. That's uh, Earl Fell speaking uh, with, uh, on the upper left, holding some papers there next to a taller guy to the right with dark hair. He's the shorter guy. And that's Llewellyn Banks there just to the left of the black hat that's raised. There are a number of hats raised and showing support during uh, the speaking. Some onlookers, that's the Medford Hotel in the background. Possible GGC members, if not supporters there. And that's the president of the GGC, Henrietta Martin, who accosted uh, one of her, uh, one of the GGC's uh, enemies, another newspaper publisher from Jacksonville, uh, and she uh, whipped him across the face with a horse whip <laughs> and was later arrested for that. So thoughts of violence. Now the uh, ballot, the vault is that open door you see on the right hand side of the corridor, and down the corridor and through those open doors at the end is the courthouse auditorium. The night before the ballot count, there was a huge GGC meeting in the auditorium, standing room only, people looking through the windows on the, on the side towards, uh, to the south side, uh, hearing what's going on, people out in the doorway. And uh, as things were getting ready for Earl Fail to speak, he came down the uh, corridor and went out the back, out the entrance off there to the, the right there, the back door, and talk to some waiting, a good government Congress people that were well up in the organization and said something along the lines of, you know, I would sure hate to see those ballots stolen and disappear tonight, wouldn't you? <laughs> along those lines, sort of wink, wink. And so he goes back, closes the doors in the auditorium and speaks. And there's a great raucous cheering and thundering applause and people are stamping their feet on the floor. And under cover of that noise, uh, these fellows who are outside take a, an ax and break into the window in the rear there of the courthouse, which was just to the right of that central back door that you see there a little bit to the right, a few windows to the right, and broke open the as yet unfinished courthouse's window into the vault, which had that frosted glass with chicken wire embedded in it, you know, not much of a security there. There's an Oregon State Police detective uh, examining uh, for, for evidence after the theft, which was discovered the next morning, great shock. Uh, Governor Julius Meyer was uh, phoned by people down here and asked, please send the state police down. The uh, state police were uh, new. There was uh, the newly formed, the Oregon State Police, and they're out to show their stuff. They wanted, this is their first really big break. And they came down like in a convoy of Nash sedans, little putt putts, if you will, uh, down the old Pacific Highway with sirens blaring. There was a fatal accident on the way down. And uh, they come and they're there in force and begin investigating what happened. Who stole the ballots? Pretty soon they figure it out. And that's the vault. You can see the window was then uh, it shut by, uh, I don't know if that's plywood or whatever, across the, the window that was broken that allowed entry. Ballots had been transferred out the window to waiting GGC members who then 
uh, took them to various automobiles. A bunch were taken out Table Rock Road to the Bybee Bridge over the Rogue River and tossed over the, uh, the side of the bridge into the Rogue River where ballots were found floating in the back eddies in the next few days. Another bunch were taken to Gold Hill for one of, to one of the fellow's uh, mother's house and burned in her uh, wood stove, her cooking stove. Oh, there's a big bonfire out in, uh, in the hills near Jacksonville. And then they ran out of time to do uh, the same thing and, uh, with the rest of the ballots. So they took the rest down into the basement of the uh, courthouse and burned them in the furnace. And portions of those ballots were found as evidence uh, soon thereafter. So it led to wholesale arrests, including of Judge Fail, and many other leaders, uh, ballot theft and criminal syndicalism. And then finally the evidence uh, trailed on to Llewellyn A. Banks himself. That's the front porch of his house. Uh, Constable George Prescott of Medford and uh, Oregon State Police uh, Lieutenant Detective uh, uh, James O'Brien were sent to arrest Banks. Another couple of state police officers were around, sent around the back of the house, see that nobody escape, would escape. Banks was in there packing his valise and putting on his uh, uh, plus four pants, you know, those knickers you saw him wearing in one of those photos. He, he was a golfer. Uh, and he was always wearing <laughs> those kind of pants, which are very old fashioned today, but they were, they were the style back then. And getting ready to flee up into the hills behind Jacksonville, where a, a, a supporter, a loyalist GGC man who was a miner was going to let him uh, hide there. Banks himself was in a probably sincere fear of assassination. The guy was uh, basically a paranoid, uh, psychotic, okay, and uh, an, an incredible narcissist. So O'Brien and Prescott go up the steps to the front door. Uh, Prescott knocks on it, and Banks' wife, Edith, opens the door with the, with the burglar chain still attached, so it didn't open very wide. And he said, Mrs. Banks, I have a warrant for your husband's arrest. Uh, I'd like to see him, please. And uh, she uh, tried to close the door, but he stuck his feet in the jam. So he, she couldn't close the door. And he said, here, let me show it to you. He's reaching into his coat pocket to pull out the arrest warrant. And as he did so, Lionel Banks appeared at the doorway with his 30 6 hunting rifle and uh, shot uh, Constable Prescott dead. With that, when that hit the news, most GGC members, it's, it appears, said, okay, that's it. We're not with this anymore. Uh, they abandoned it. And some were in a rush to get their cards back and to go to the police and say, we didn't know what was going on. We're not part of this. So there was a, a real uh, exodus of supporters. But then there were those who remained true uh, for years afterwards to him, true loyalists. And uh, this is the scene after the shooting. I, I, his body's laying there in the upper left. I cropped that out. I don't see any need to show that. But uh, you know, those are the onlooker, onlookers, as you always have, and more in the front, the police officers having people move back so the ambulance uh, fellow are carrying the stretcher of, of George Prescott off to the morgue. Number of trials, Earl Fail was found guilty, sentenced to a number of years in the state penitentiary. Other involved in the theft and so forth were also found guilty and served stretches. Llewellyn Banks, uh, and most of these trials could not happen here. Things were just too divisive to have a, a jury pool. Uh, but uh, Earl Fail was tried over in Klamath County, Klamath Falls. Uh, Banks and Eugene, and he was on trial for his life. Both he and his wife uh, faced a uh, possibility of the death sentence. But uh, he was, in the end, uh, the Lane County uh, jury found him guilty, but uh, not uh, recommending the death sentence. So he was sentenced to life 
I think they made a pretty good uh, case that he was insane. And I believe he was. He was lucid. This whole time he was completely lucid. He could do deals, convince people. He was not a schizophrenic. He was not, you know, he was, he was in the world, yet he had this thing going on inside him of utter narcissism and a strong, strong paranoia in this delusions of grandeur. That's my take on Llewellyn Banks. Out of this, the uh, Mail Tribune, Robert Rule had stood against all of this, just as he had done during the Klan period. And uh, Banks and Fell uh, just uh, uh, slandered him mercilessly uh, in their papers. But for this uh, crusade, if you will, standing firm, the Tribune won the Pulitzer Prize. So that's finally how I found out <laughs> why that was on the masthead. So I think I am, uh, there was a thought at, by the late thirties, Hitler was really making uh, uh, himself known throughout the world. And this article came out uh, calling Llewellyn Banks, the man who tried to be Hitler. People were afraid of fascism, Nazism in this country. Many of them were, some were not. Uh, but I don't really see uh, the Good Government Congress as a fascist organization. It's a, it's a part of something that goes way back in American history of what are, what are called by historians backcountry revolts or uh, backcountry rebellions, where people who feel oppressed and put upon by a more affluent elite, typically in, in merchant centers or, or cities, uh, rise up. And that's been happening since, even in a sense, since Bacon's rebellion in, in the 1600s and definitely Shea's rebellion in Massachusetts would help cause the U.S. Constitution to be written. And then came the, the New Deal, the CCC and other things ameliorated uh, conditions in Southern Oregon. And with World War II and the post-war housing boom, things really took off here. Uh, with uh, the wood products, the lumber industry. And the Good Government Congress became forgotten. The Jackson County Rebellion, people of an age still remembered it. And I talked to a number of them when I was researching the book. But by and large, most people did not know about it.